off here. I have a friend who believes in polytheism, but says he also believes uh, in one all power for God. How can one? Exp that's that's pretty much the same question. I bet that was the same caller. There is a kind of belief like that, and this will surprise people. People go, "Well, that's completely off base. How could you be a polytheist and be a and believe in one God? Those seem to be inconsistent with each other." So as it turns out, this type of belief is found in many different civilizations to this day. And this type of belief made it possible for early Christians to believe that Jesus was a God, but not the God. And this system is called henotheism. Henotheism means that a person believes that there's one great grand God who runs everything. He's the great Zeus in the Greek world, the great Jupiter in the Roman Empire. No, no one in the Greco-Roman world believes that all gods were created equal. They believe that there was the, the grand God, and, and then there are minor deities whether it's the god of love, Venus, the god of wine, whether it was the emperor Octavius, Caesar Augustus, uh, whether it was Vespasian, Yamachshemai, they all believed, all the Greeks, the, the members of the empire believed, if they were doing the right thing, that, except for the Jews, they all believed that Octavius was a god after he died because he was a great, considered a great emperor. Nero wasn't, so he, was never, he never got promoted. Uh, but the key is, but no one thought in this worldview that all they were all like God, they created the universe. They rather, these were very, very special people, and then they were exalted to the state of divinity. They were really conceived through a virgin conception, like the mythical founder of Rome, Romulus, who was said to be born of a virgin. They believed that, and he was said to be a deity, a god, because he was literally the son of god it, it wasn't it wasn't as crazy as you think that means they thought that of course there's the big big great god he's running the planets he's you know he makes sure everything is moving in the right thing he's created everything but he can't pay attention to your little problem that your wife won't conceive he only that can't deal with the problem that your cow doesn't give milk he can't deal with your little stupid problem that there, it hasn't rained in two weeks and your crops are going bad you think Zeus or Jupiter is involved with that? How could someone be involved with that? So you have minor gods, lesser gods, and there were many, many tears. This is really what would develop in the early church. You can be a god, meaning you could be a divine, but you're not the god. I mean, the god created the heavens and the earth? That No, but you could be certainly the son of God. And in the Greek world, the, the, um, the opening passage of of Mark would make complete sense to be the son of God, except it would be Octavius, who was the, the adopted son of, of, of uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, strangely, Julius Caesar's biological son didn't, his name was Caesarian, he didn't make it, but Octavius, the adopted son, made it. So the key point is that you can, and this is really what I think is at the heart of the, not the most primitive Christian expression, but this is already the overlays that we're seeing in Paul's Carmen Christi, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, of what we're seeing in 1 Corinthians, where Jesus is Lord, but he's not the Lord, there is the Lord, and then there is Lord. Now, to a, this is very important, to an Abrahamic monotheist today, this does not make sense. Because in our world, especially in the West, there is God and then there's everything else and nothing could fill that breach. They are, they're just God and then there's everything else. And if you're not God, you're really, really not God. This is not, this is not a platonic view. This is not the Greco-Roman view. Also, we have very similar views in the Eastern religions, where you can have in Hinduism the great god. Now, there are, in Hinduism, as an example, there are many different fusions, and Hinduism and Eastern religions in general are far more 
eclectic than Abrahamic religions. It doesn't have that kind of level of orthodoxy and canon. You have scripture, but not canon like in, in Judaism, or like you would have it in, in Christianity or in Islam. And the Hindus will say, well, there is one grand, grand god, but then there are all these other minor deities. You find that in the Egyptian gods, the North African god system. And in fact, that's where Tertullian, really a brilliant Christian thinker, he was a convert to Christianity. He was a Latin church father, born in 165. He converted, I think, 197. I think he died in 212. He's a very bright fellow. He was a, a lawyer. He was in Carthage. Now, that might not be very interesting at first glance, but it was very important. That means he lived in North Africa. It was the part of the Roman Empire that was, that was in the African continent. I can't begin to tell you how important Carthage was on every level, but also theologically. It's not an accident that so many fundamental doctrines of the church emerge from North Africa, Alexandria, for example. So it's not a mystery of why Tertullian would adopt schemes of the Godhead and articulate them in, in that he coined the word Trinity because he had to speak to the people he lived among in a language they understood, and this was his influence. So he translated it for them in a way they would understand. The Egyptians didn't convert to Christianity. Christianity converted to Egypt and to Rome and so on and so forth. So that's how someone can be both a polytheist and a so-called monotheist at the same time. But the language, this kind of language in our Western monotheistic thinking doesn't work very well. But in order to grasp history, you have to let go completely of the world you live in and jettison entirely and walk into the ancient world to understand how people process, logical, rational people process this kind of information. So thank you for your question.